But if inquiry is confined solely to the world of experience, why doesn't all of it come under the rubric of what we now call science? I mean, what is specifically philosophical about it? Well, of course, science and philosophy are not very sharply distinguished by Aristotle, but I think what he would say is that there is a general search for a structure of explanation that's common to all the scientific areas. And in his work, The Posterior Analytics, he provides an account of how the philosopher will search for what he calls episteme, or scientific understanding, in every area, whatever. And in every area, the philosopher is supposed to find certain principles that are prior, that are known first and more basic than the others, from which, as conclusions of a deductive argument, the conclusions of that science will follow. Now here, he says, we have a faculty by which we're equipped to have insight into the fundamental first principles. And I, I want to pause here for a minute, because I think this is also something that's been badly misunderstood about Aristotle. This is a faculty which is called intellect or nous, a rather famous term in his thought. Nous and being the Greek word. Nous right? being the Greek word for intellect or mind. And Aristotle says that it's with this faculty of mind that we grasp first principles. Now, for centuries, this was thought to be a special faculty of intellectual intuition by which we could step outside the sphere of our experience and apprehend, as it were, prior to all experience, the first principles of science. Now, I think you can see already why I want to say Aristotle would be opposed to that kind of foundation for science. But in fact, recent people who've been working on the text of the posterior analytics have argued quite successfully that that's also a bad reading of the text, that in reality what noose is is a kind of insight we get into the explanatory role, the fundamental status of a principle, by our experience in using it to give scientific explanations. Aristotle was, wasn't he, the first major Western thinker to actually try and map out the separate sciences. In fact, he gave some of them the names that we use to this day. Yes, and I think that's true, and I think his work has still been of importance for people working in those sciences, particularly mm -hmm. in the science of biology and um, and where his work on explanation has recently come to be extremely important and interesting. Now, can you give an example of the way he would go about, as it were, isolating a subject area as a single field of inquiry? All right, well, I'm going to give an example that's, um, in our view, wouldn't be from one of the sciences as we think of it, but a, a very general inquiry that he has in his work on metaphysics into what he calls substance. Now, this I, think, is a, wait a minute, I must interrupt you here because I think this word metaphysics, which we're going to hear a lot of, ought to be explained. Can you explain the word? Well, its origin is uh, disappointingly trivial. That is, in an ancient edition of Aristotle's work, the editor put the work that had the title uh, metaphysics uh, after the work that was called physics or natural explanation, and the work, the title simply means what comes after the work called physics. It means the book after the book, the book, after on, the physics. book on physics. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And what does the word itself come to mean in philosophy? Well, it's hard to give a single account of this, but uh, roughly one might say, I think, that the, what metaphysics does is not to isolate one range of things and inquire into those, but to pursue some perfectly general questions that might be asked about anything, whatever, questions about identity, continuity, logical form, and so forth. The, the fundamental constituents of the world that we experience. Yeah. Space, time, matter, etc. The questions that pertain to any object, uh, whatever is the, that all. exists. Yeah. 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 Now, central in this whole project is the question which Aristotle calls the question about substance. Now, I want to start by trying to ask what this question means, because I think we don't very naturally have an intuitive sense about what a question about substance could possibly be. Now, if we read what Aristotle writes and try to reconstruct what his questions are, I think we find that there are really two questions which he holds together quite closely. The first is a question about change, and the second is a question about identity. Now, the question about change is this. Of course, in our experience, we come in contact all the time with things that are changing, that are the leaf buds, turns green, turns yellow, then withers, a child is born, grows mature, withers, dies. Now, the question is, if we're to talk about these changing things, there still must be some it that remains the same while the attributes of the thing are changing, or it'll be very difficult for us to talk about it. So the question that Aristotle asks here is, what are the more continuous, more persisting things on which we can anchor our discourse about change, things which themselves persist while properties or attributes are changing? Now, the second question, which he calls the what is it question, I call the question about identity, goes like this. Supposing I 
point at some object in my experience, say Brian McGee, and I say, all right, what is this really? Now, what I'm asking here is which of the many properties that you have, which impress themselves on my senses, are the more fundamental ones, the ones that you couldn't cease to have without ceasing to be yourself? You know, now clearly you could change your jacket, put on a different color of clothing, and you would be, still be Brian McGee. On the other hand, it's not so clear that you could cease to be human or cease to be made of flesh and blood without ceasing to be yourself, without, in fact, being dead. So Aristotle's question about identity is the search for which are the parts or elements in the thing which do play that very fundamental role. And they have to play two roles, isn't that right? I mean, which, which are the characteristics that are absolutely inherently fundamental to, fundamental to any object to make it be that object? Mm -hmm. And secondly, what are the characteristics that persist through any change so that the identity of the changing object remains the same? Yes, well, Aristotle wants to hold these questions tightly together, and I think there's a good reason for that, because as he sees it, to single out what it is that underlies change, that persists through change, you have to single out something with a definite identity, something about which you could answer the what is it question, something that is uh, structured enough, definite enough, to be the subject of some discourse about change. On the other hand, if we're going to talk about the what is it question, we better have as our answer something that itself is persistent enough. It's not always going out of existence while we're actually uh, talking about what it is. Now, early philosophers before Aristotle had not always held these questions so closely together, or they had focused on one uh, and given strange answers as a result to the other. Let me give you two examples. Some early natural philosophers were led, seeing that it looked to them like matter, was the most persistent stuff. I mean, they could see that trees, children, animals were born out of material stuff, and then when they died, what was left around was, again, material stuff. They concluded that matter was the basic underlying principle of change, and then they seemed to conclude from that that matter was also what things really are in some fundamental way. So they took an answer to the first question, and without much further reflection, they applied it plugged it into the second one. Now, on the other side is an explanation given by some Platonist theories, I won't say by Plato himself, but one that Aristotle finds in Plato's school, which focuses on the identity question and tries to explain the identities of things in terms of their relation to certain stable, immaterial objects, the forms, in something like this way. They'll say, well, you, Brian McGee, are brown in color because of your relation to the form of the brown. You are human because of some relation in which you stand to the form of the human, and so forth. Now, it's Aristotle's view that we've got to start in answering this second person. I'm going to talk about the second person first and then come back to the materialists. We've got to start by distinguishing those two kinds of properties that you have. Because the property of having brown color on you is a property that precisely is on, or as it were, residing in you. That is, it's one you could easily lose without ceasing to be yourself. Whereas, as he would say, the property of being human is not like that. It's not one that you could lose without ceasing to be yourself. So in his early work, The Categories, he distinguishes these two sorts of properties, the ones that are simply in the subject, and the ones that, as he puts it, reveal the being, the what is it, of the subject.